Good morning. It's Monday. I'm uh, recording this today here at home because I have to uh, uh, have a teledoc meeting with my <coughs> doctor here in just a little bit. And it's easier to do it here than to run up there and run back here or to get up there and try to do it later. So today you get it from here. It's been a little bit of a challenge. We have seven or eight clocks that all strike. And so now two times I've started three times I've started and uh, I was overwhelmed by the striking of clocks. Uh, so bear with me, maybe we'll get through it uh, this time. Of course, this will be the only time you see, so you'll think, oh, it went fine. Uh, today we're dealing, of course, still with the lockdown or whatever you want to call it, the shelter in place. Things are really different, aren't they? Uh, school won't be resuming this year. Graduation for graduates is going to be odd. Uh, we still have a memorial service to do when we can gather again. Uh, weddings have been really kind of askew where only 10 people could be in a big church building. I saw one where the father of the bride was walking her down the aisle and uh, he had on a mask and she did not. Uh, we uh, have been given some directives by the bishop, but not to the extent that you would, I guess, expect. I mean, we've been told we uh, don't expect to worship in April or May, uh, maybe not into June. Uh, but we preachers have been given permission to not wear a mask if we're in the sanctuary by ourselves. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but the, the reality is, I know some people think these rules are silly, but in the United Methodist Church, we, we live strongly on John Wesley's uh, teachings and, uh, of course, the teachings of Christ as well. And uh, one of John Wesley's first precepts was do no harm. And so how can we do what we do the way we want to do it and do no harm? Listen to First Peter this morning. Maybe, maybe it'll apply. For it's a credit to you, if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you were beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. When he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness by his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So if you, if you dissect this just a bit and you start at the beginning, it's a credit to you if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. Well, maybe uh, many of us might uh, argue that this uh, sheltering in place, that the closing down of the economy is unjust. And according to this scripture, it would be a credit to us if being aware of God, we suffered it, even if it was unjust. And then he makes the comparison, if you endure while you're beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? So suffering the consequences for something that you've done, that isn't righteousness. But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. I don't know about you, but I don't often wake up in the morning and think, what can I do today to get God's approval? It's not high on my list to, to wake up and think, wow, God, uh, I'm not sure what you think of me today, so... I want to live my life today hoping to get your approval. Now, maybe it should be what I do. 
Maybe I should be thinking more about getting God's approval. Maybe that's one of the growing pains and growing edges that I have is to start to focus more on what God thinks of me than what you guys think of me. I know that sometimes these decisions that we make at the church are hard and some of them are just no win. Sometimes people are going to say, well, you know, if you don't do this, I'm not going to do that. And, you know, there's just nothing that can be done about that. If the, you know, Dr. Uh, Mr. Spock in, in Star Trek frequently said, or at least one powerful time said, it's for the good of the many, not the few. And in some ways, public education is like that. The public schools deal well with the general population. They don't do well with exceptional children on the right side or exceptional children on the, the other side. They, uh, they deal better with the masses, the people that fall in the middle. And we at the church, we find ways to figure out what our common calling is. So you might say, well, <clears throat> if we have all people that are 55 and plus, we just don't need to concentrate on a children's program. Well, that would be wrong because sometimes children do come and sometimes we get children in the church and, and we need to raise them up with an attitude of gratitude. We need to raise them up knowing that Christ is King. Uh, we wonder sometimes if we need to have other things going on at the church. You know, for us, at our church, Bible study has been a really significant thing of glue that holds the group together. Oh, it's somewhat competitive, the men's Bible study uh, <coughs> has a certain number of people that uh, do a certain number of things in a certain way. And the women's Bible study does something different at the same time in the, the building doing something entirely different. And both of them seem to be very popular. And right now, both of them would dearly like to meet. Yeah, I, I would like for them to meet. I enjoy that part of our church very much. And we were given permission, if you will, if there is such a thing by the bishop to have groups of 10 uh, less than 50 groups of 10 uh, could meet uh, and they could, you know, have meetings and do stuff as long as they did all the CDC things, social distancing, wore masks, um, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then there was this caveat that said, well, of course, that doesn't include anyone over 60 because they should just stay at home. So I think some of us over 60 are suffering unjustly. How about you? But I do know that there are people with underlying health issues that need to be very careful. Uh, not that we all don't need to be careful. None of us really want to gain this COVID-19. What we want is immunity from it. And what we don't understand yet is why some people that look as normal as you and me are carriers of it. If we could understand that, then we could isolate and we could do the right things, but we don't know. Testing is not yet at the level it needs to be. Uh, we've got people in our church that were sick back in January or December that feel fairly certain they've had it. But we don't even know for sure that having had it gives you an immunity from the next time. You see, there's just so much unknown. It's this invisible enemy. And so you can apply Peter's uh, writings here, I think, when it says, for it's a credit to you if being aware of God, which we are, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. And I think certainly some of us are suffering unjustly. I know that finally it seems like the supply of uh, essentials at the grocery stores is mostly back to normal. <clears throat> We're able to go to the grocery store and get what we need. Yeah, we're eating at home more than we did before. We're also trying to eat out at our local places uh, every other day or so because I know they're hurting as well. I uh, don't know what you do when you have a building that's based on having an X number of seats. And even if we're allowed to meet together again, uh, we're going to be separated by much more distance. There'll be far fewer chairs 
far fewer places. We are suffering unjustly, and there's nothing really we can do about it except think back about Jesus who suffered unjustly as well. He committed no sin. No sin was found in his mouth. No deceit. When he was abused, he didn't return abuse. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. When he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. And maybe that's the place that we could go. Are we, are we people that are submitting to the authority and uh, willingly or not, just doing what God calls us to do through the authorities? Or are we resisting and creating angst and animosity and maybe even influencing some other person not to wear a mask, not to do what they need to do, and then causing them through what we didn't do to get sick. You see, the do no harm clause, boy, it goes deep, doesn't it? When I wake up in the morning, I say, my goal is to do no harm today. No harm today to anybody. That's by my actions, by my influence, by the things that I have to offer. Do no harm today. You see, that's a challenge. And then the next one, of course, is do all the good you can. Well, I find it very difficult to do even number one and number two without number three. Number three says we stay in love with God. In other words, we attend upon the ordinances of God. What are the ordinances of God? Well, prayer, Bible study, reading the Word, being a part of the Word, attending upon the sacraments when they're available. I read an article yesterday. It was very interesting that people seem to think sometimes that we worship the words in the book, that we're people of a book. Wesley was often misinterpreted by his words of saying he was a man of one book. He, he believed the Bible was first, the words in the Bible were first, but he would have read anything. And yet it's not the book. It's not the words. Even what John says when he said the word made flesh, he didn't say the word was made into letters that go on a page. So if we trust that there is a living God and we can trust him enough to turn our life and will over to him, I just wonder what difference it makes and the attitudes that we have, uh, the ways we talk to each other, the ways we respond to authority, the ways we live through what we're now calling the corona time of COVID-19. I talked to several church members who received the stimulus money. Uh, Kathy and I have not received it yet, but they received their stimulus money and were giving it to uh, food pantries of the Houston Food Bank to feed others. I mean, there are some of us that desperately need that money. But if you find that you don't, boy, there are so many things out there that do. I talked with Bill Nash at length yesterday. We haven't really promoted him coming to Hope yet because we just don't know when we'll be and whether we can even support it and whether it'll be effective this year. But we also trust God. And I trust that there are people in his church, in his group, that will need help getting to the camp. I think they're going to a different camp this year. It sounds like it's one up in the woodlands. But they know that those kids need them. And those kids have also suffered unjustly. You see, it's not just about us anymore. What we do affects so many across so many boundaries, across so many places. Even this podcast or our devotional broadcast crosses the boundary of state lines, county lines. People are watching it in Burleson County and others are watching it in uh, Florida in some county down there. The responsibility we have is to offer Christ to continue to offer Christ. And to offer Christ, we have to have Christ. We have to believe that Jesus is King. 
We have to believe that he is really Lord. We have to believe that he really escaped the grave, that he is living, that he's with us, that he can guide us and direct us. And I'm convinced that he'll never, ever guide us into the wrong adventures. We'll try some things that may or may not work. But we love Jesus Christ at our church. We believe that he's the Savior. And we believe that following him is more important than getting what we want. It's a tough pill to swallow, friends. It's not as easy as it looks. Can we endure this time, albeit unjust, and unjustly, for the name and in the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? It's my prayer that we can. It's my prayer that we will. And I know you all love Jesus as much as I do. But sometimes we need to get together. We need to unify about what we hear him say. What he's saying to us, friends, is all the things he said to those disruptive people back in his time. Submit to the authorities. Render under Caesar what Caesar's. And continue to spread the word. And the assurance he gives you, us is he says, Lo, I will be with you always, always until the end of the age. Friends, let's pray. Gracious God, come with us on this journey. Send the Holy Spirit to be our leader, comforter, and guide. Remind us that Jesus lives, that he is not enshrined in a tomb but is alive and well and willing to guide us through what some may see are unjust times others may just see as difficulties he is the king of kings lord of lords today in whatever way we can we turn our lives and will over to him in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.